Hello students, this is the first time I've done this, I hope um, it's useful for you. This is um, a little bit of extra revision for A2 literature. It's probably about the equivalent of one or two lessons, um, and all it requires is that you have with you um, a pen, um, some paper, um, possibly your text as well, that might help, but really given that it's a closed book exam, this stuff should be in your head by now as well. And of course at the end I'm going to ask you to um, create uh, an essay as well, so practicing a section A uh, essay based on Macbeth. So it's for the A2 literature students and it's called, rather prosaically, how to construct an actual argument that actually works and actually argues something. So. Um, Obviously, I'm not asking you to be one-sided or to only put one argument into your text. What I'm trying to get here is that across the, the one hour that you have to give that answer um, in the mock and also in section A of the exam, that you really do offer something that is a proper structured argument with, with good interpretations and that, that removes from a clear introduction through different interpretations towards a conclusion. Okay. Um, so I am also going to put memes in it um, of your argument is invalid, which I find quite funny. It's about, obviously, uh, Macbeth. As I said, it's going to take you about probably about the equivalent of a double period. Um, uh, if you are not up for having um, a, a two-period sort of lesson, um, then you can. I am going to actually just give you uh, the um, revision that you can do in the form of the essay. So I'm actually going to give you an essay title. So here we go. Um, by the end, so you're going to work through this with me, uh, some skills and abilities um, uh, on how to argue better, but if you don't want to listen to this video, I can't force you to listen to the video, if you don't want me doing um, skills development, things like that, if you just want to get on with writing something, then you can just get on and answer this question now. Okay, so Lady Macbeth is a figure of compassion as much as she is a figure of contempt. To what extent do you agree? So everything I'm doing is going to build up skills towards being able to write arguments better, the entire video. I, I know it seems quite long, but it is sort of like a, a double lesson equivalent, or at least one lesson equivalent when we add in all those tasks that I'm going to ask you to do in a bit. And it will help you to answer questions in general more effectively, uh, and this one um, in particular. Okay, so, but if you desperately don't want to listen to me banging on about it for an hour and a half, then uh, really you can just um, get on and write that now. Okay. So then, to start, we have a little starter activity, um, and I'm just going to get you to do uh, a couple of little warm-up exercises, uh, just to get your brains working, you'll need a pen, you need some paper. Um, you can probably do most of this just in your head, but uh, the last one you might need a little bit of paper to work something out, okay? So, let's do the first one together, actually. Uh, odometer is to mileage as compass is to A speed, B hiking, C needle, or D direction. Okay, odometer is to mileage as compass is to what? You got it? Okay, <laughs> right. Uh, so it, this is one of the things where you don't actually really need to know what an odometer is in order to work this out. It helps, of course, but it's just about the relationship, isn't it, between words. So odometer is to mileage, is compass is to what? Well, I'm imagining, given that it's got the word meter on the end, um, odometers measure mileage, um, and therefore the relationship is measurement. So what measures what? And of course, a compass measures direction. So it measures direction. So therefore, the answer has got to be D. Right, if you want to um, have a go at the next two yourselves, there they are. Windows to pay in this book is to novel, glass, cover or page. And play is to actor as concert is to symphony, musician, piano or percussion. Just, um, I'm not sure how this works technologically, actually. I'm sure you can sort of pause the video or something like that. Um, and just uh, come up with the answers to those. Should only take you about 30 seconds. Okay. Sorted. So the answer is obviously uh, windows to pane. This book is to what? Well, windows are made out of panes. You get panes of glass within windows. So uh, books are made up of pages. You get pages within books. So a novel, of course, is a type of book. It might well have a cover on the book, um, but it's um, about the relationship of the words, what they actually mean and the relationship between them. And then, of course, play is to actor as concert is to what? Well, you might well have symphonies in a concert, there might well be a piano, there's probably going to be some percussion, but really, the relationship is that actors are in plays, and therefore musicians are in concerts. So, the answer is B, musician. Okay, let's do one more, slightly different now, different type of formal logic to get your brains in gear. Have a look at this. Debbie, Kimmy and Michael have Ferraris. Michael also has a reliant Robin. Uh, so quite an eclectic taste in cars there. Jensen has a Mercedes and a Model T. Rubens also has a Mercedes. Debbie also has a Bugatti Veyron. Ooh, lucky Debbie. And Rubens has just bought a Toyota Prius because you know Rubens cares about the environment. Um, 
other than the fact that he's got a Mercedes. Okay, so who has the fewest cars? Again, it's about logic. Just give yourself 30 seconds. Pause the video if you need to work it out. Who has the fewest cars? Fair enough. Well, the answer is, of course, Kimmy. Um, this is, again, it's about logic. It's about reasoning what do words actually mean based on the information we've got in front of us. So, uh, Debbie, Kimmy, and Michael have got Ferraris. That's one each. Michael also has a Reliant Robin. There's another one. Uh, for Michael. Jensen has a Mercedes and a Model T, so that's two for Jensen. Rubens has a Mercedes. And then if you look at the last line, Rubens bought a Toyota Prius, so there's two for Mercedes. And then Debbie has a Bugatti Veyron. We've already seen that Debbie in the first line has a Ferrari, so two supercars there for Debbie. Um, so the only one where we don't have any information on is Kimi. So just based on the information we have in front of us, the words on the page and the logic um, that we have to use to, to analyze this, it has to be Kimi who has the fewest cars. Now it might well be that Kimi actually has another car, but the point is that this is about um, using the evidence that is in front of us. Um, we can't just make stuff up if we're trying to work out things um, reasonably. Okay, so the answer is Kimi. But why are we doing this, Phil? Why are we doing philosophy? Why are we doing logic and reasoning? It feels a bit like maths, if I'm honest. Well, it might. It might feel a little bit like maths. But this is about getting your brains in a less mushy state. It's about being really clear and developmental with your arguments, developing really, really good responses that alongside your brilliant analysis of metaphors and interesting original ideas will mean you get fantastic marks. So two main areas for development then is why we're doing this. If you're going to write a proper argument in the proper fashion for Lit B2, uh, sorry, uh, the AQA Lit uh, B Gothic question on Macbeth, Doing a bit of analytic philosophy and working on your reasoning skills are good ways to show, make sure your arguments are in, in literature are far clearer and to, as I say, generally make your brains less mushy. It's about being clear, essentially, is what we're doing. There's two ways we're going to do that. So the first one is that getting word meanings in order, and we're going to do some activities on that in a minute. So what we need to do is be absolutely clear on the denotative, that's like the dictionary definition, the denotative meanings of words before then moving on to the connotations and different interpretations. So often you're given like a buzzword in a question, like, I don't know, evil, something like that. And immediately students um, fly into really unique and original and strange takes on that word, which is great, but they haven't denotively you know, sort of looked into the, in depth what evil tends to mean or what some really clear meanings are first before they get into the ah yes but what even is evil anyway type of resp response so trying to be clear essentially is what we're talking about especially in, in introductions then we're talking about reasoning so following undeniable logical steps following a point or argument clearly and following a logical step from a to b so not only is it about getting your meanings clear getting your definitions in order but it's also about making sure that your evidence really, really, really does lead towards the, the interpretation that you're making, that you can definitely say, you know, point A to point B, this pushes this interpretation, this adds weight to this reading, or this draws us towards this particular conclusion. Okay, so essentially it's about arguing better. And then, you know, the, the end point of this is that if you improve these skills in clarity of meanings and logical reasoning, you'll be a far better essay writer and better at coming up with arguments overall. So you'll be able to win arguments with your friends and family and stuff like that. Okay. So then, uh, what is an argument? I hear you silently ask. Well, um, obviously, you, you know what an argument is, but obviously we need to disentangle it from what people use um, colloquially when they're talking about arguments, which is disagreement, verbal fight, but obviously in, in English literature and, and lots of other academic subjects, an argument has a much narrower meaning. So this is about, you know, when it, it, it asks you to construct an argument or develop an argument or even to dis it, it, and analyze or explore or explain, argument might be part of this. And so we need to know what it is we're doing when we're arguing something in, in literature. So first of all, it doesn't mean your opinion. No, you, you should be able to argue things you don't actually believe. It doesn't mean persuasion. Uh, persuasive features, rhetoric, they might make the, the person putting forward the argument seem more um, believable or reliable or exciting or charismatic, but persuasive techniques are not the same as, as good argument techniques. So it's not about being persuasive, really, is what we're going to try and talk about with argument uh, styles. It doesn't mean uh, what you truly believe deep down. Um, you might believe whatever you want <laughs> about a text. You might hate it, <laughs> you know, I don't know. Um, if you if you do love the text that we study together, I really hope so. But um, it's not about what you really truly believe about a text that matters. It's about can you lead me towards a conclusion? 
It doesn't mean being one-sided. You, you can actually be one-sided in an argument, provided you deal with other interpretations. Uh, but an argument doesn't mean that you only look at one side. It doesn't mean that you. It certainly doesn't mean that you just, you know, assert again and again what what your opinion on a, a topic is. And it doesn't mean, contrary to that, it doesn't actually mean being open-minded to anything. Um, is there a really good song? Oh, is it by now? Um, Tim Minchin, isn't it? Tim Minchin's so, song about you know if you if you open your your mind too much, your brain falls out. And um, that's quite interesting as an idea. You know, we want you to look at different interpretations of texts and take on board different ideas. But you should be okay with saying, yeah, but that interpretation doesn't work, or there's not enough evidence for that interpretation. So being open-minded to new ideas, but also being able to tell when an idea is not that great or an interpretation doesn't quite work. Uh, an argument doesn't necessarily mean coming with something original. You, there's a, this sort of tendency that you want to you know, change the very nature of literary study by a conclusion, but you're not going to do that. You, you, you're going to come up with a view. You're going you're to come up with a case. You're going to evaluate different readings and then push towards your own interpretation by the end. But we don't expect you to be able to come up with something that nobody has ever suggested before. Um, you're probably going to come up with something that is critically a commonplace. It's something that... Um, Others have said it's just you're going to say it in a more interesting or uh, more developed way or just prove it with, with better evidence or demonstrate it with good evidence. So then it's just then an argument. It's just really the way we're using it in literature is just a process of reasoning or a process of reasoning about a topic or question. So the point is it's going to have steps. There's, there's, technically they're called premises, but for us the points, facts, evidence you know, the data you've got, the things you're saying about the text, and they must lead towards a conclusion. So an argument often deals with several different views, but it won't veer off course. It will have a trajectory, it will have a path. And following the premises, the, the, the evidence, the data, the statements, the, the claims should definitely, or in our case probably, lead to the conclusion. Opposing interpretations should never completely derail a good argument. So uh, it would be very strange if you um, set off arguing something and then had another thought and then quickly said, "Oh, everything I've said so far is probably nonsense." You are, some, you know, you should be um, focusing on leading us towards the conclusion from the start, planning out the shape of your argument from the start, so you can integrate and synthesize different views. And, and essentially, that means you've just got to be fair, fair with different interpretations. Okay. And then overall, very, very importantly, uh, an argument is a journey towards a conclusion. You, you've got to take me towards a conclu conclusion, lead me down a, a path, be strategic with your deployment of evidence, and, and not be persuasive, but be really convincing. I don't want to be persuaded of your view. I, I would like you to convince me that you've got a valid um, point or that you've got a valid argument you're developing about, about the text or an answer to the question. Fair enough. Okay, right. I'm just going to have another sip of coffee and then we'll get on. It's all right. My house is a shoe, so your argument isn't valid. Okay, um, I really like that one. That's an argument stopper, that one, isn't it? You will not win, because my house is a shoe. So then, um, let's not get all, you know, too denisive about things, but I'm not going to patronise you. You know what opinions are, but let's just make sure we understand how opinions, facts, and arguments differ. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about dinosaurs, uh, essentially. I don't get enough time to talk about dinosaurs when I'm doing literature, so let's talk about dinosaurs. Um, I believe dinosaurs existed millions of years ago is my opinion. And it is, actually. Um, I, I do believe that the dinosaurs existed millions of years ago. I don't believe that the Flintstones was a documentary. Um, however, there's a factual element here, of course, which is... Um, about understanding the difference between opinion and fact. So I might worry I'll have the personal opinion that dinosaurs existed millions of years ago. Fair enough. Uh, but uh, if I was to say dinosaur bones have consistently been dated using a variety of different independent dating techniques to 65 to 200 million years ago, I'm providing you with a fact. Now, you, you know, the scientists among you are probably going to go, actually, Phil, it's 370 million years ago, something like that, but just for the sake of example, um, this is a fact. And the thing that makes it as a fact is that you can, you, can, you can verify it. You could go out and check. So facts are things that can be, be demonstrated. Um, they're things that you could go out and, and do the same sort of, you know, uh, even just looking yourselves or the same tests. You could have a look and you could you could say, yep, that, that does appear to be the case that they have consistently been dated using a variety of different independent dating techniques to 65 to 200 million years ago. OK, so there we've got a fact, something that you could demonstrate and check, as opposed to my opinion that, that there were dinosaurs millions of years ago. 
this is the argument form then, or at the very least this is something like an argument. So I'm going to construct an argument based on that fact that dinosaur bones have consistently been dated using a variety of different independent dating techniques to 65 million years ago. So I'm just starting with the same fact. Scientists have used lots of different dating methods that all intersect on these dates. It's not just one, there's several, and they all come up with this idea of there's different methods as well, so you know, different methods of dating. I'm not a scientist, but it's just an example. Um, so that fact that they've been dated independently with different methods to, to many millions of years ago. Moreover, this is my next point, there is no current alternative scientific explanation as to how dinosaur bones could come to appear to be millions of years old, other than them in fact being millions of years old. So that claim is that, you know, that, that it's it's conceivable that there there is another way that this this could happen. It's just that there isn't one that we know of. So there's no scientific explanation as to how they could have. Um, uh, the hallmarks of being many millions of years old other than them being many millions of years old. So this leads me to my conclusion then, which is that we should accept that dinosaurs existed 65, 200 million years ago, at the very least many millions of years ago. Now before you start you know, complaining, I'm not telling you what to believe, I'm just showing you what an argument looks like. You, 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 I'm, we're gonna, and in fact I'm going to show you what's wrong with this argument in a minute. <laughs> so um, th this, is, this is you know an argument that we should believe, essentially, we should accept, we should believe that dinosaurs existed many millions of years ago. We're going to look at what's wrong with that argument in a minute. So, the thing that makes it an argument then, not an opinion and not just a fact, is that it's got a shape. It's a process of steps leading to my conclusion, and I knew what I wanted to argue before I gave you those two premises. I, I, I knew where I wanted to go. Um, it's an argument that, yeah, you, you probably should believe that there were dinosaurs. Again, not actually telling you that. It's just an example. Um, so there we go. That's, that's, that's what an argument is. It's got a shape, okay? And it's no different in literature. Uh, you know, it's not going to be about dinosaurs. It's not going to be about science. It's probably not even going to be about that many facts other than the facts of what the text is doing in front of us, what the words on the page really are. There's going to be far more interpretation and differences of opinion. But fundamentally, if it's going to be an argument, if it's going to lead towards a conclusion, then it's got to do something similar, something logical, something that's going to... To, uh, sort of takes on a journey towards that end point, that, that, that end. They're therefore, you know, the concluding idea. Okay. However, so then, there's the argument. I've just put it in premises and the conclusion to separate out those two claims I made and then, and then the conclusion I got to. Um, again, I'm not telling you what to believe. Um, some ways that we could make sure that we'd, we're taking issue with this argument correctly. You could undermine that first um, point, the first premise. Uh, the first premise is that dinosaur bones have consistently been dated using a variety of different independent dating techniques to many millions of years old. So you could take issue with all those dating techniques. You could look at them and say, yeah, but this one's got a problem, and that one's got a problem, and that one's got a problem, and therefore they're all um, not accurate enough to make that type of claim. You couldn't just take issue with one. You'd have to take issue with, with all of them, okay, which of course would be extremely difficult. Um, or you could take issue with the word bones which I'm, I'm hoping some of you picked up on already, actually. Yes, I did make a deliberate mistake. Uh, you could distinguish it from fossils to attack peer one. But you should be recognised, of course, that even if you did that, that wouldn't be a killer blow to the argument. It would just mean that I would have to rephrase P1. It would just mean that I'd have to be a bit more careful with my language. You could, if you wanted to take issue with the conclusion, uh, sorry, with the, with the argument in general, that the claim that there are valid alternative scientific explanations. So my second claim is, look, there's, there's no other explanation for how this can happen other than, uh, you know, them actually being millions of years old. So you could look at that and say, well, actually, Phil, that there is this sort of um, um, theory within science. There is this, this view that um, there is this way in which it could come to you know, be many millions of years old, or it could come to be compressed in this many layers of rock, or all of these other different dating techniques, all of them are, the, 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 uh, 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 you know, explicable, but there's this alternative, so you can't claim P2. Um, all I'd say to that is, of course, that, um, you know, if that if you can do that, you, you, you sort of get a Nobel Prize, really, you know, <laughs> if you can give it an alternative scientific explanation, you would turn science on its head, so, you know, I'm not saying you can't, but you'd be amazing if you did. Um, I, th I think this is a, obviously a, a very good one that you could argue, and probably this would be a point, if you were going to take an issue with the, one of the claims, one of the premises, this would be the place to do it. You could argue that we should accept non-scientific ex explanations um, over scientific ones. So it, you could say, for example, you could argue, yeah, well, okay, 
I agree. The science is, is pretty strong. I agree. The claims about you know dinosaur bones being millions of years old, they might not be entirely accurate, but they're certainly in that ballpark. I agree. It's very difficult to you know think of an alternative scientific explanation as to how that could be, but we can accept um, non-scientific explanations. So I've got this other theory. You know, so that doesn't necessarily even have to be a religious one. It could just be something like um, you know the aliens did it, or it's a trick by you know, um, or we're all in the matrix or something. That would be really interesting and that would be a very effective way to, to undermine that claim, I think, if you could do it. Okay? But I think the real thing here, to, to, to get to the crux of what an argument is, how it works, is that you could say there's too much of a leap, that the conclusion doesn't follow uh, from those two claims, even if they're true. And if you're grasping that, then you will really grasp what, what arguments are and how they work and, and, and how we can apply this to, to literary text. And in actual fact... Um, there is there is a leap. I've, I've purposely constructed an argument that doesn't quite work. The reasoning is flawed between P2 and the conclusion. So the reasoning is flawed in the argument. Um, the statements, uh, you know, <laughs> I, I, I will uh, put it out there, uh, probably are true, actually. <laughs> um, they, they, they have been consistently dated. That is true, it's factual. Um, there is no current alternative scientific explanation. As I say, there might be non-scientific ones. I don't know what that means, but um, there will be other alternative explanations. Um, so P2 appears to be accurate. You know, those two things appear to be pretty okay as, as statements. As again, you believe whatever you like and take issue with me, disagree with me. But uh, even if they're true, the point is the conclusion doesn't actually follow. It's, it's not a, that good argument. And this is where being so clear with our language and so clear with our reasoning comes in. So can you see what the problem is? Even if those two claims are true, the conclusion doesn't follow, is what I'm saying. And I've purposely chosen something that, you know, probably most people do believe. Actually, yeah, you probably should believe in dinosaurs because of all the fossils and everything. Okay, have you thought about it? Yeah, okay, right. I'll have another sip of coffee while you're thinking about it. Does the conclusion that we should believe this stem from the fact that it's verified scientifically? Okay, let's have a look where the problem is. There is some invalid reasoning in there. There's the argument again. Look at the conclusion. Look at the words, what it actually says. We should accept that dinosaurs existed many millions of years ago. But I haven't demonstrated that. I haven't demonstrated that. I, I've... I haven't demonstrated that we should accept scientific facts, even if they're facts, and even if there are no de other decent explanations. I've asserted, yeah, 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 you know, these are facts, so we should, you know, you know, believe them. But I don't know how I got to the should. I haven't proved that we should believe what's factual and supported with evidence over the stuff that isn't. You know, um, as an analogy, um, uh, why can't I believe that illness is caused not by germs but by miniature pixies why can't i believe that um dinosaurs were you know uh, robots uh, that were used by martians to get around i surely i'm free to believe whatever i want about these things but the conclusion is that i should believe a certain thing essentially what you're saying is that i should have a certain opinion about something so the problem is here is that i haven't done my job i haven't argued that we should believe stuff that's scientifically demonstrated. And remember, I'm not telling you that this definitely is scientifically demonstrated. It, 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 you know, it, it, it seems to be. But what I'm saying that even if it is scientific facts, you know, that 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 um, you know fossils, dinosaur bones, etc., um, have been dated. And even if there's there's no other explanation as that how it can happen, I still don't have to accept. That. I don't have to believe you. But your your conclusion is, Phil, that I should, and I don't think you've done your job there. Okay. So um, I need an extra argument. I'd need to extra, an extra argument to show we should believe stuff that's scientifically demonstrated, tested, evidenced, uh, and factual over that which isn't. Now, in actual fact, of course, I think most of us probably could come up with that argument, but it's not there at the moment, so the argument doesn't really work. So I'm hoping that I'm demonstrating here that being really, really careful with your words, <laughs> really, really careful with the words you're using, especially in introductions and conclusions, but also being really, really careful in thinking, yeah, but does what I'm saying really gain support from the evidence I'm deploying? Or is it just sort of adding to it or generally adding to it? Am I being really crystal clear? And, and hopefully when we get to you know, defining things about the Gothic and about the Macbeth and different debates about that, it will be clear about what I mean there. So I'm hoping actually as well, this is the first time anyone's ever um, helped someone learn about Macbeth 
uh, through uh, talking about dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anyway, the argument doesn't work. So, um, Another meme for you to enjoy there. I, I win because R Robocop is riding on a unicorn. Do you know what? Um, I've just realised as well that um, you might not actually even know who Robocop is. Um, so <laughs> for, um, that, that distresses me greatly. Um, but um, yeah, he was a guy in the late 80s and they put him on a unicorn to make you win an argument there. Oh no, I think, wasn't there a, um, a film two years ago? Or something, or a redone it. Yeah, something, something like that. Right, anyway, Phil, get on with it. So, uh, problem one, word meanings, very quickly. Um, we've said already that the, one of the big problems with constructing arguments is what words mean. And you probably noticed some of the problems with that previous argument about dinosaurs uh, that had problems with the words um, being a little bit ambigu ambiguous. So, um, talking across purposes with, with words, um, talking, um, um, using words in a way that perhaps other people might not use them, uh, being mushy with that language becomes a real problem. Okay, so a few things to look at here. So, first of all, in arguments, most of the problem rests on what words actually mean. Uh, and often this is unclear, and often people disagree only because they mean different things by the same word. So, uh, you know, if I was to say, ooh, ooh, it was a miracle, something happened and it was a miracle, um, and somebody else will say, Phil, it wasn't a miracle because the laws of physics haven't been changed. And I'll say, you're being very, very unharsh, or you're very harsh and unfair, and how dare you? Um, and we're going to have, you know, a Barney about it because we mean different things by that word. Do we mean intervention by God to disrupt the laws of physics by miracle? Do we mean a change to the natural order? Do we mean an unusual event? Do we mean a good event? Um, we have to work out what we mean by a word if we're going to argue about it. And it's exactly the same in literature. And so with that previous argument, when I said dinosaur bones, you, you probably knew what I meant. I certainly hope you did. But bones and fossils aren't the same thing. You know, so I might well have meant fossil, but I said bone, and that was a problem with the argument. Um, so when you say supernatural, for example, if you're describing the witches in Macbeth, and what you mean is powerful or weird, rather than literally something that you've defined as supernatural to mean, perhaps beyond the laws of nature, or inexplicable from the laws of nature, or to concerned with the god and the devil, something like that, um, there's going to be a problem. You, you, you know, we're going to be um, using mushy language there. So it wouldn't, in that case, I should have been clearer with the word dinosaur bones. And then also the word scientific. I mean, even that word scientific, uh, we could probably have a disagreement about. You know, when you, when you put your leg out of the bed and put it downwards rather than upwards to get out of bed in the morning, you're being scientific in the sense that you're, you know, going along with the scientific method that you've established through, established through observation and, you know, um, your own experience that you, you know, it is true that the floor's down, so you put your leg down. Um, but some people mean by scientific, um, you know, only people wearing white coats. So some people would argue, well, psychology can't be a science, sociology can't be a science because you don't get wet to wear white coats and you're not a laboratory. So there's a the huge range of meanings of that word, and perhaps I could have cleared that up in that argument. Um, I could have meant, you know, in accordance with the basic principles of science, just like, you know, testing stuff. Um, or I could have got in accordance with the laws of nature, the laws of physics, something more like that. So I should have defined those first. And then I said, should accept, in that final really problematic statement, uh, you should accept, you know, this. I, I clearly didn't mean must believe, but then what did I mean? I, I couldn't possibly mean everyone in the whole world, possibly a baby. So there was a big problem there. Right, so are you going to do an activity? Okay, so hopefully you've got some pen and paper, stuff like that. Um, so there's a list here of um, some words, and what you're going to do is you're going to work out what these words mean uh, and where there might be some confusion about them. So you pause the video on this screen, uh, choose one or all of them, <laughs> several is what I've said, and try to come up with some different meanings, uh, each as clear and unambiguous as possible. Okay, so try and write down at least two or three different clear meanings of, of that word, different ways of understanding what that word means. You could even look it up in the dictionary if you wanted. Uh, obviously, more importantly, is it, it makes sense in your own head. But then I want you to um, think about, well, well, where might some confusion arise with this word? Okay, I'm not going to go over all of them, um, but I just want us to give a, a, a good idea, and, and, and I really would like you to, to do this, this, this uh, little task, please. Okay, so just pause the video and try and write down a few uh, meanings and uh, try and think about some points of confusion with one or two, or, or if you're feeling, you know, uh, um, into the video, you might want to do all of them. Okay, so pause that, and I'm going to have another sip of coffee. Right. Okay, so you paused it there. Hopefully you didn't just listen to me banging on. So I'm not going to talk about all of them, but, you know, uh, all of these, 
do have um, uh, problems. They, they could be misinterpreted. I'm just going to pick a couple. So, for example, if we look at um, a word like um, supernatural, we've dealt with that a lot, that, that gothic theme of, you know, supernatural. Usually what we mean by supernatural is, you know, that, that which is beyond the natural or that which is not natural. But there's, there's a real difficulty with that, you know. So, first of all, we'd have to define natural. What do we mean by natural? Usually people mean the laws of nature, so, you know, the physical laws of, of the universe that are the same wherever we are. But that's quite scientific, and we're, we're literature students. Usually, you know, we can give examples of the type of thing we mean by supernatural involvement, uh, you know, ghosts, witches, um, psychics, things along those lines. But it becomes muddy because, you know, something like, even like a psychic, um, it depends what you mean, doesn't it? You know, there might well be some natural process, some bit of the brain that allows you to, in a way, read the thoughts of another person. But that could be totally in accordance with the laws of physics. It could be something that's, that, that's happening, it's just we haven't discovered it yet. In which case, it would seem like it was this magical power, but in fact it was just a new faculty we had that we hadn't discovered yet. But supernatural tends to mean, um, uh, you know, beyond the natural. So, you know, um, God, obviously, would be um, dis described as, 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 as supernatural, a supernatural being beyond the universe in some way. Uh, ghosts um, don't appear to be, you know, confined by the laws of physics. They seem to be, you know, surviving forever. Um, supernatural visitation would be, you know, like demons and goblins come and get you. All those things. But it's difficult, supernatural. There's several different ways of, of describing it. And obviously natural as well would be, you know, do we mean laws of physics, laws of nature? Do we just mean anything that's green? You know, there's a difficulty there. And then I'm just going to do one more, uh, which would be uh, evil. You know, evil is, is a big issue within the Gothic, a uh, big issue for Macbeth. You know, the philosophers among you will probably already have disentangled natural from sort of moral evil. Um, what does evil really mean? Some people think of it as, as, as only a supernatural force. So people would think of it only as, you know, things that are sort of, you know, magically dark, you know, demons and the devil and, and things like that. But most people, more generally, would just mean sort of you know, suffering, sort of sort of pain and, and suffering and, and, and bad stuff, you know, that, that type of evil, which, which doesn't require any belief in the, in the supernatural. So you could have, for example, uh, natural evils, like, you know, there's an argument saying uh, a volcano is uh, a natural evil, um, which is, you know, fair enough, you could say that. Um, or you could say um, that um, there's sort of moral evils, like, you know, humans doing things terribly to each other. Uh, you, could, you could define evil in lots and lots of different ways, but there would be that, that muddiness about it. So all I just think is, you know, think about those words, what you mean by it, and, and, and try and define what you mean by it to start with. So continuing with that problem then, um, it's not just about getting your definitions right when you're given a keyword and a question, but it's also about saying what you really, really mean yourself when you're writing your essay. You know, do the words definitely mean exactly what you mean? And do you really know exactly what you mean? You should get into the habit of, of trying to be as clear in your own mind uh, before you put a pen to paper of what you really do mean by your interpretation. So we're going to do another activity now where um, you're going to look at some statements and we're going to look at, well, you know, there's some mushiness in them. There's some words or phrases that don't really do the job of being clear, and, and we could we could improve them. So what we're going to do is I'm going to show you them all. You're going to spend it should take about ten minutes or so that time writing some notes to try and clarify, try to clear them up in your own notes. Okay, so here they are, and then you can pause the video and um, try and come up with something clearer for those. So the witches are supernatural as they can fly. Lady Macbeth is clearly not so evil as she feels guilty. When Macbeth says, is this a dagger I see before me, he's hallucinating, because it's not really there. And the play is all about blood, and it is always very violent. So just pause the video, and for each of those, if you can try and clear them up, please. Okay, thank you. Right then, I just had a little break there. Uh, you might have heard some students coming in. I had to pause that while I was talking to some students. So um, hopefully you've now written down some... Um, clearer definitions, maybe you added some extra material uh, to those not very good statements that we saw before. So that was the first one, the witches are supernatural as they can fly. Well, you know, people don't tend to fly, so that might indicate them supernatural, mightn't it? Um, but hopefully you can see that that language is just too muddy, it's just not clear enough. So I would say something like this instead, I would say, 
First of all, I'll maybe give a bit of evidence, develop it. But the, the point is I'm aiming for clarity. So through the line, hover through the fog and filthy air, that's um, Act 1, Scene 1. Uh, Shakespeare almost certainly indicates that the witches have the power of flight, a stock element of a witch's representation alongside familiars and cauldrons, adding weight to the interpretation that their powers are beyond natural explanation. So I've really tried to not only give a bit more evidence there, but to try and be, be very clear with what I'm claiming. So I'm not claiming they are definitely supernatural, as the, the muddy statement is, is, is possibly suggesting. But I'm saying it almost certainly indicates that they are. It's, it's very good evidence that they are. And I'll also um, define the supernatural a little bit better in this as well. I've said, you know, they're beyond natural explanation. Um, so that's my um, you know, more accurate definition of what supernatural really means. Uh, Lady Macbeth is clearly not totally evil if she feels guilty. Well, again, I mean, you're not wrong, are you? You, you, you know, she's not totally evil. She, she doesn't come across as totally evil. The fact that she feels some guilt, or possibly <laughs> feels some guilt, does indicate that she's not to be represented as, as, as a simply evil character. But there's so much muddiness with words like clearly, for example, well, it's not clear, um, evil itself, um, and guilty. I mean, you're feeling guilty. Is, is that... Um, a simple feeling or, or I mean I'm not entirely certain what the person writing that really means by it um, and also there's the fact that you know it's a play as well which is not added in there so to clear that up I would do something like this I would say I know it's a bit long perhaps you haven't, you haven't done quite this much but um, it, I've, I've added a bit to, to clarify as much as I can Shakespeare undermines the interpretation that Lim Lady Macbeth is simply nefarious uh, use of you know spell <laughs> use of thesaurus there to uh, try and get a different uh, word other than evil through her representation of her guilt. So he undermines the interpretation that Lady Macbeth is simply nefarious through the representation of her guilt in the form of the gothic feature of somnambulism, that's sleepwalking, and her unconsciously compulsive behaviour in Act Five. A sleepwalking and constant washing of her hands suggests she's deeply emotionally troubled by the murders and psychologically collapsing as a result. Though whether she's consciously aware of this remains questionable. Her line, out damned spot, could indicate that the blood is a metaphor for her feelings of guilt. However, the fact she's trying to wash the blood away adds more weight to the view that the blood symbolises not her feelings of guilt, but her fear of being marked as a murderer in public. Now again, I'm sure you haven't done quite that much. I didn't ask for that quite that much. But the point is I'm trying to home in as best as I possibly can on a fair and clear interpretation that expresses something similar. Look, she feels guilty. What's the relationship between that and the fact she's, she might be seen to be evil? So I'm trying to be as, as clear and as accurate as I can. And then just a couple more. Um, Macbeth says, is this a dagger before me? He's, he's hallucinating as it's not really there. Well, hopefully you can see the problem with that. The first one being, well, nothing's really there. It's a play. Um, and, and once again, we've missed out that, you know, Shakespeare is doing the representat representing here. It's not Macbeth, who, he's not actually real, he's not actually hallucinating at all. So we need to clarify that with something like, um, first of all, where's it happening? Towards the end of Act 1, when Macbeth is about to murder Duncan, his famous question, that's missing, it says, it's actually a question, is this a dagger I see before me, can be interpreted as evidence of a collapsing psychological state and a hallucination which, in his own words, emerges from the heat-oppressed brain. So I've added a bit more weight and for clarity there, not really to do any analysis, but to clarify, yes, this is represented as a hallucination. A supernatural explanation is not required here, though some productions move away from psychological explanations and instead have Macbeth drawn on to his damnation through supernatural manipulation, perhaps from the witches. So again, I'm just clarifying and, and putting that as, as clearly as I possibly can that, yes, absolutely, this suggests it's to be read as some sort of hallucination, but I am aware that there is an ambiguity there that, that different productions can, can take advantage of. It still could be seen to be a supernatural visitation, a, a, an actual supernatural dagger, rather than something only my Beth can see because it's not really real. Okay, um, this one, uh, hopefully you'll never write anything like this. The play is all about blood and it's always very violent. Well, um, in anything ever, I think I would avoid saying all about. Um, I'm not sure anything is all about anything. I imagine there's always different interpretations and, and, and things are a little bit more complicated than that. Um, and it is always very violent. I mean, in general, just the word always. I, I, I'd be very, very wary of that in a literature essay. It's, it's, it would be very unusual if something was always the case. Um, in, in a play, for example, I'd be very, very, very surprised if it was always the case um, something something occurred. Most things, really. So I would clarify that saying, you know, well, it's 
Rather than it's all about blood, what I'm really saying, what I really mean, is that Shakespeare makes lots of references to blood, which is true. So references to blood are frequent throughout the play. That's as clear as I can possibly be. There are lots of references to blood. They're frequent. Often blood is deployed as a metaphor for violence, specifically murder. Most notable and Macbeth's references to stepping through blood in Act 1. I am in blood stepped so far that should I wade no more. Returning were as tedious as go o'er. And then to clarify a bit more, here the blood he has stepped in indicates Macbeth's past violent deeds, especially Duncan's murder, and the references to go over or going over foreshadows the ensuing murders of Macbeth's family in the next scene, establishing blood as a symbol of Macbeth's increasingly blood-soaked journey. So b blood, yes, absolutely, there's lots in it, and blood and violence, yes, absolutely, they're there, but what I'm saying is that blood is used as a symbol for an increasingly blood-soaked journey. I'm not saying it's just blood, I'm not saying it's just violence, but but it's increasingly so, and that, that's its function in the play. So it was about me trying to really get to grips with what I actually meant by that statement. I actually mean there's lots of references to blood, and that is thematically linked to the violence. That's very different from saying the play's all about blood and it's always very violent, which is just not clear at all. Okay, um, just a quick um, <laughs> a Big Bang Theory reference for you there, just to keep you... Um, 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 interested. Science and derps to invalidate your argument. And yes, you are right. I did have to look up the word derps. Uh, okay, second problem then. Um, so we've done a little bit about clarity. Let's get on to some stuff about reasoning, the logical reasoning. Um, we've seen how making leaps is a problem. I got to this argument, oh, we should believe in dinosaurs. Um, we should believe dinosaurs are millions of years old. Again, didn't really say that. It's just an example. Um, uh, um, and the problem was there was a leap. It didn't directly follow one thing to the other. Um, and the, in literature, the big issue is whether the evidence we're providing definitely adds weight to the interpretation or whether we're just sort of assuming or asserting that it does, making the evidence sort of fit the conclusion or the evidence add towards an interpretation is quite difficult. So we must also make sure that the shape of our argument is clear. And that's about reasoning too. It's about being totally clear on what is definitely evidence perhaps for a statement, what's definitely evidence perhaps against a statement, and what is evidence, which is always a big bit of this in literature, that could go either way. But really clarifying things first. Well, okay, if there's a statement, what is, is really very likely to be evidence for that statement? what's really very likely to be evidence against it, and then thinking, oh, what's the muddy stuff in between? What's the complicated stuff? Okay. We also need to think about strength as well, strength of evidence. I think that's part of, of reasoning, uh, making judgments about sort of the strength of evidence in relation to different claims about texts or in general arguments. So strength of evidence and the strength of claims. So often a concern is that students make huge claims. Examiners are always talking about this in, in lots of subjects, actually, especially literature, that, that students make huge claims like all people in Shakespeare's time believed in witches with only minor or unconvincing evidence. It, I, I just think that... No matter what evidence you had, all people in Shakespeare's time believed in witches is actually just not verifiable. You, you just couldn't know that. There's lots of things you can know. You, there's lots of claims you can make, but you, you probably couldn't really know that. Um, and so usually big claims require big evidence. You might have heard this idea that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. So th what the good rule of thumb is, is just make the claim smaller and make the evidence bigger. Give the, the claim... Um, more gently or more tenuously or perhaps it could be this it's possibly that it's a good evaluation to suggest that or a good interpretation to suggest that and then lots and lots of evidence it, and, and usually I think I've told my classes this several times more evidence than you think you need you, you, whatever you think you need in order to demonstrate a point give me a little bit more okay so the problem with reasoning then in, in um, in uh, uh, literary essays, specifically Macbeth that we're studying. Um, I'm going to show you this with some examples. So here is um, a sort of pared down argument that you might have perhaps one side of an argument or perhaps even as uh, you know in the entirety of an argument padded out. So let's have a look at these claims and uh, conclusions. So look at these arguments and the problems with them. So the witches fly and cast spells, therefore they are responsible for Macbeth's downfall. I've seen this said in essays. They fly and they cast spells, therefore they're responsible for Macbeth's downfall. Okay, take yourself a minute, really do think about it, isolate what's the problem. What is the problem there? The witches fly and cast spells, therefore they're responsible for Macbeth's downfall. So exactly as with um, my uh, dinosaur argument, yeah, can you see where the, the problem lies? Let's have another one. 
People in Shakespeare's time believed in the divine right of kings, therefore Macbeth should be killed as he killed the ruler appointed by God. So this is a different problem, but can you isolate it? Can you isolate the, the problem in reasoning there? Have a think about it. What's, what's wrong now? What's going wrong? Lady Macbeth sleepwalks and tries to wash away the blood from her hands, therefore we sympathise with her. I've seen that claimed. It's, it's not actually not that bad of a claim, but can you, can you sort of work out if, if you were to say that, where the problem would be. James I wrote a book called Demonology, um, I think I spelled that right, uh, which argued that witches and demons are real. Therefore, the audience would have been very scared when Hecate arrives, it's the goddess of witchcraft, arrives in Act 3. Lady Macbeth is shown to be very powerful in Act 1, so therefore Shakespeare was a feminist. Now, you might have a, a little laugh at that last one, but I, I you know, I'm, I don't wish to be cruel, but I, I have seen several times um, through the last few years of, of teaching Macbeth um, students essentially making that argument, essentially making the argument that, that Shakespeare was a feminist. Now, again, depending on what you mean by feminist, <laughs> it, it's possible, of course it's possible, but there's a, there's a real logical uh, problem there by what most people mean uh, by feminist that you probably should be able to isolate. So once again, pause the video, um, try and work out exactly what's wrong with those statements. If you can work out what's wrong with them, you're on the way to being able to create better claims with better evidence and, and, and reason a little bit better in your own arguments. Take a minute. Okay, so let's see if, if you've isolated the problem. The witches fly and cast spells, therefore they're responsible for Max, Max, Max downfall. Come on, what's the, what's the problem with that? Well, it's just insufficient, isn't it? It's just not enough. There's nowhere near enough evidence for the claim, for the, for the conclusion. So it, even if the witches are powerful supernatural agents, which is questionable, this doesn't automatically mean that they take responsibility for Macbeth's downfall. It doesn't negate other factors. Other factors would still matter, like his guilt, like his ambition, like his wife, for example. So, you know, the very fact that people are flying around and casting spells, absolutely that's supernatural, but that doesn't negate natural explanations. So responsibility remains an open question, regardless of whether they're supernatural or not. So it just doesn't follow that because they're supernatural that they must be, therefore, responsible for Macbeth's downfall. The next one was that people in Shakespeare's time believed in the divine right of kings, therefore Macbeth should be killed, as he killed the ruler appointed by God. I hope you've got the problem there. It, the, the first claim's um, itself problematic, isn't it? You should be able to see the problematic with just the first premise, that claim. But the reasoning is also problematic. Shakespeare should, uh, Macbeth should be killed, as he killed the ruler appointed by God. So the problem there, as I'm sure you've noticed, is that it's contradictory. It's internally incoherent. It doesn't make sense, even if it's true. It doesn't follow. It's, it's, it's contradictory. So, first of all, yeah, many people did believe in the divine right of kings. Certainly not all, otherwise why write a book trying to convince people about it? But Macbeth is also a king. Of course he is. He's, he's a king. So the argument is that we should kill a king because killing a king is really wrong. That's just an internally, internally incoherent argument. That doesn't make sense. And uh, for those of you wanting to take the uh, morality of this a little bit further, the idea of internal contradiction, just apply that logic to the death penalty for a bit of debating fun. Uh, murder is so wrong, uh, we need to murder you. So, uh, Lady Macbeth, um, and do you know what, with that one, um, I'm not even going to do the uh, being open about dinosaurs. Um, uh, <laughs> you believe what you like. No, you're not allowed here to believe what you like, because uh, the death penalty is um, saying murder is wrong. So wrong that we have to murder you for it. Right, Lady Macbeth, oh, I'm, I'm joking, believe what you like. Lady Macbeth then, sleepwalks and tries to wash away the blood from her hands. Therefore, we sympathise with her. Right, um, she sleepwalks. Ish, yes. Tries to wash the blood away from her hands. Um, sort of, symbolically, yes. Therefore, we sympathise with her. Well, actually, I think the conclusion is probably true at that point. But you can see the problem. She does, yeah. So yes, she does sleepwalk, and yes, we might. Yep, um, sympathise her, but it's insufficient evidence for the conclusion. That's just a straight case of that's not enough for you to get where you want me to go. You'd need at least another two or three things there. Perhaps consider um, the way in which she's portrayed, and of course the, 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 the perspective from which we view her, where she starts, where she finishes. I'd leave at least another two or three bits of evidence before I could come with you on that, be convinced of that conclusion, of that particular point. Uh, James I wrote a book, uh, Demonology, uh, which argued that witches and demons are real. 
Yes, sort of, he did, yes, that's true. Therefore, the audience would have been very scared when Hacker arrived in Act 3. I hope, I really hope, you've got the problem there with that argument, which is, it's a play. Um, Lady Macbeth, very powerful in Act 1, so therefore Shakespeare was a feminist. Well, again, there's a problem here with definitions, isn't there? It depends what you mean by feminist, but... Um, you know, there's, there's a lot going on there that doesn't follow. So have a think about it. You know, it, what happens to her? Let's say she's the most powerful character imaginable, undermining gender stereotypes left, right, left and right. But are you just ignoring the fact that she withers away and dies? I mean, she's got to be seen to be punished, hasn't she, in some way by the play? Um, plus, you know, um, Lady Macbeth, she's shown to be very powerful in that one, so therefore Shakespeare was a feminist. That would involve um, um, the invention of a time machine, really, to actually find that out, going back and asking him, because, um, you know, uh, the, the fact that somebody puts something in a play doesn't mean that that is their actual view. It's perfectly possible to you know, put on a particular view, or, you know, Shakespeare had puts characters in there that believe one thing and other characters that believe exactly the other. It doesn't mean that they're mouthpieces for him. We couldn't know that. And then, of course, finally, same as the last one, it's a play. Plays don't work like that. Um, you know, um, the fact that uh, James wrote demonology and argued demons are real doesn't mean that you therefore get more scared when Hecate arrives. You, you don't forget that you're in a theatre. You're in a theatre. You paid to go and see it, um, in the case of a... Of, of a um, a public performance at the Globe, places like that. You, you paid to see it. You know it's not real. Um, it doesn't stop it being engaging and thrilling. You might be taken away with the spectacle when Hecate arrives, but um, you're not going to be more scared because you believe Hecate is real. You know Hecate is being portrayed by an actor here. Okay. Fair enough. So those are some um, uh, logical problems that we could fall into when we're, we're um, arguing different sides of, a, of an overall piece in a, an essay. Yeah, there we go. Right, um, you're going to do another task now. So um, what we want then is um, unambiguous evidence. Uh, everybody in, in, in the classes that I teach, and if anybody else is watching this, I'm sure you're good at this as well, everybody in my classes is, is, is very, very effective at arguing really brilliant, complicated interpretations, coming up with great ideas. But what we need to do with the arguments is also um, start with something really solid. Start with something that... You can be very skillful with your analysis of the text in order to demonstrate, but really the actual claim and the evidence is, is pretty clear, the relationship between them. So not starting in a muddy, clever way, but starting in a very, very clear way, a very denotative way, before we then fly off into something really exciting and, and interesting in that, that bit towards the end of the essay, what I've labelled that sort of killer idea bit, you know, where you, you bring in your idea that, that really is, is quite exciting and interesting. Before you get anywhere near that, you've got to start somewhere, somewhere solid. So here's a, a statement that's going to relate to that essay we're going to do in a minute. Um, Lady, Macbeth is, <laughs> Lady, Macbeth, Lady Macbeth is portrayed as evil. It's not a bad statement for a question. It's conceivable they should give you something like that. Lady Macbeth is portrayed as evil in the play. So I've done a little Venn diagram. I'd like you to draw one too. It would probably take a big piece of A4 paper, maybe even A3. Just two circles interlinking in standard Venn diagram. And on one side, I want you to put some evidence that, it, no, 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 she's not portrayed as evil. No, she isn't. Definitely not. And then on the other side, I want you to put, um, yes, yes, she is unquestionably, unambiguously, yes, this does add to the claim that she is portrayed as evil, and then leave quite a big space in the middle, put them going across each other quite a lot, because there's going to be a lot in the middle, that, that it, there's some evidence that really could go either way, or it's more complicated that than that, or well, it's not quite as, as simple as that. Okay, so this one I really, really do need you to, to do this. It's going to be pretty much impossible to do your essay um, unless you've, you've, you've thought about this. So um, make sure you've got a big piece of paper, get a Venn diagram with a good bit of intersection in between them, and then if you try and get at least three or four different pieces of evidence, it might be some quotations or some um, um, things that occur in the play or something to do with staging, that's always a good thing to think about as well, theatricality, how it's staged, in those three sections, the nope, the yep, and the could go other way. Okay, so pause the video and do that. It should probably take you about 15 minutes. Thank you. Right, okay, uh, slight policies there. There was a slight pro problem with the recording, but hopefully this, this is now working. So what we're doing now is looking at the, the, the Venn diagram that you've done, that you've definitely done. 
Um, uh, if you haven't done that, actually, just pause the video and do it, okay? I can't force you, yeah, but it's going to be difficult to do the essay unless you've done this, so don't just wait for me to tell you stuff. Add stuff to your Venn diagram now as we're going through. Right, so, yeah, this is the evidence. Definitely she's portrayed as evil. Well, she helps execute a murder. Start with that simple evidence. Look at her executing that murder. She's, you know, she she she, she daubs blood on the grooms to, to to make it seem like they did it. She's sentencing those people to death. Really, you know, it's pretty dire. That that's pretty cruel. And of course, in context, she's uh, helping um, uh, execute a murder of a king. She's helping to commit regicide, which is of course something that would be seen as as evil at the time. She undermines gender roles, and it's it's probable that probable that that would have been seen as evil at the time. She utilizes the language of evil, so often her, her language is is cruel and harsh and unforgiving. But sometimes it's also almost witch-like in in the sort of figurative sense. She talks about you know, come you murdering ministers, you know, fill me top to toe with direst, direst cruelty. I think is the quotation that she's using this sort of almost supernatural type evil language to describe her cruelty and actions. But as I've, I've said to my classes, I'll be very very careful about claiming that therefore she's actually supernatural or actually a witch. I think you'd be probably stretching things. You'd have to do an awful lot of work to demonstrate that. Um, She's rather unpleasant to Macbeth's manhood. It's another part of it. She's she calls him, you know, like the poor cat of the adage. Like, you know, she's um, uh, essentially attacking him um, for being a coward, for being a, a, a little scaredy cat. And um, obviously, we've we've heard about him being this incredibly brave warrior. So it's 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 very um, very very unfair. That's that's part of it. But it's it's very unfair to Macbeth as a character. And it's very manipulative. Again, which might contribute to the characterization as being evil. She's portrayed as manipulative, cruel, and unforgiving. You could interpret her as a sort of feminist icon in a way, a sort of um, you know sticking it to the patriarchy in some sort of way. But really, she's 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 portrayed as, as as manipulative. She's not supposed to be seen as from the start this amazingly positive moral figure. You might like the fact that she undermines the way in which society ruled at that time. You might like the fact that she'd be attracted to the, the charisma of the person, but you, you've got to accept before you get there that her language is cruel, she's a manipulative person, she's very unforgiving, she doesn't seem to want to um, um, uh, you know, display those moral qualities of womanhood that people would have believed at the time. And her motivations are shown to be materialistic. If they're shown at all, she's, she's, she's sort of quite unsympathetic, particularly at the start. And if there's any motivation there, it seems to be for Macbeth to get what he's owed in some way, which is, you know, power. Okay, um, I was actually interrupted there by... Oh, you might still be able to hear it next door. Um, the uh, uh, cleaner came in and tried to uh, clean this, this room I'm recording in uh, the teaching rooms while I was in it. So apologies for that. If you can still hear a hum in the background, that is actually... Um, um, the cleaner in the next room, uh, rather than you know the sort of the the, the hum of um, murdering ministers coming to attack us. Right then, other side. Have a look at the other side of your um, um, your Venn diagram again. If you haven't done it, uh, do it now. Okay, you really need to think about it. Don't just listen to me. Try and do this yourselves. So then, no, she's she's not simply evil. Um, Shakespeare gives her a history of having lost a child, crafting some sympathy. He invites us to sympathise with her in Act 5 by having us view her downfall from the compassionate perspective of a doctor and a serving gentlewoman. He doesn't have to put those characters in there, but he does, he, he, in, in prose as well, rather than in verse. So he invites us to view her di uh, sort of uh, psychological collapse from the perspective of these caring characters, of these characters who are sympathetic to her and don't just judge her as evil because she reveals, probably reveals, that she's been involved with the murder of Duncan. She, uh, her ability to feel guilt and her psychological collapse in Act 5 suggest humanity rather than malevolence. If Shakespeare really wanted us to see her as evil, as simply a sort of a force of suffering and harm, why would he have her wither away so distressingly? Why would he have her um, collapse psychologically into this liminal state of somnambulism? Why, why bother doing that? Um, and then, of course, you could do something clever with viewing perspective. You could say, well, look... You know, it's not just, you know, sort of a, a, a feminist interpretation to suggest that she's empowered. She's very empowered. She seems a great character, a very empowered character, which might undermine the sense that she's simply evil. If we like her, you know, is it are we just liking her because she's terrible and causes harm? Or is there something positive in her empowerment? Another one would be there's no evidence of a link 
uh, to the form of supernatural evil displayed by the witches. So this is where it would be very important to disentangle natural and supernatural evils in an introduction, for example, so that you could then return to this issue. So indeed, if we think about that, the, the, the relationship with sort of supernatural, devilish, you know, malevolent, nefarious evil, um, it's Macbeth who's more consistently in contact with that. Yeah, um, wit this form of evil. So apologies for the spelling mistake there. But that's true, right from Act 1. Uh, he speaks the words very similarly of the witches. He's this repeated structure. You know, so foul and fair day I have not seen, which repeats the, the language of the witches from Act 1, scene 1. And of course, he commands the witches um, both in Act 1 and in um, Act uh, 4, I think. And of course, uh, she doesn't actually kill anyone which is very significant. There's, there's, it's, it's a manipulation, sure. It's um, um, uh, you know, accessory to murder in the, in the modern sense, but she doesn't actually kill anyone, whereas lots of other characters um, are murderous in this play. And she's not given the death of a murderer. So um, Macbeth's death is the death of a murderer. It's the death of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a villain, really, um, to, be, to be dispatched uh, by a revenging um, person. So he to be dispatched by uh, Macduff, who's on this quest for revenge. Um, she sort of withers away, really. There's a possibility that she commits suicide. Malcolm raises that possibility. But it's just as likely she just sort of dies. You know, the, the doctor raises questions of her sort of spiritual death. Of uh, you know, he, he says, I, you know, I can't treat this uh, illness, suggesting there's something morally or spiritually wrong with her. But she sort of withers away, which is, again, quite... Um, a tender almost in, in representation doesn't suggest that it's the death of someone who would we're really desperately trying to punish as being a terrible character and of course she's not without human emotions she's not simply a femme fatale you, you, and again we need to be very careful with how we we are clear with this she can be portrayed as a femme fatale you know she can be portrayed as a character who is sexualized. There's, there's lots of evidence in Act 1 that she's using a sort of sexual power over Macbeth, but you've got to do analytical work before you get there. You can't just assert that she's this sexualized femme fatale character. Help me believe you. And even if she is, she's not without human emotions. So she, she's, she's portrayed as not having many, but surely there are some. So again, that might undermine the idea that she's she's um she's evil so you know she's got human emotions she's 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 not simply evil right and then of course the stuff you all like doing which is making it complicated let's get a bit wibbly you like the wibbly you know like the the ambiguous and the complicated and that's great so now we can now we've established those two sides now we've clarified those two sides we can now get a bit more complicated with it so it's a bit more complicated than that. Look at all these. Lots and lots. I'm going to just whack through them. Well, what even is evil anyway? You could do something clever with that. Explore different types of evil. She's this type, but not that type. Would be quite an in in exciting thing to do. Uh, well, she's not a foil character. So um, she's, she's got roundness to her character. She's psychologically complex in the context of other characters in the play. So, of course, bits of her are evil and bits aren't. So you could do something interesting with the fact that she's not a foil character. She's what might be known as a round character. Um, even her most evil speech is ambiguous. So you could say, well, she's not evil, she's not not evil, um, but she's this ambiguous liminal state in between. Um, even that line, you know, when she talks about, you know, um, while it was smiling um, in my face, have plucked my nipple from its boneless gums and dashed the brains out. Um, even there, the language is actually quite tender before she starts about um, caving uh, the baby's head in. She talks about, I've given suck, uh, and know how uh, tender it is to, uh, to nurse the baby that milks me. I think that's what she says. So there's a tenderness, there's a maternal, and maternal nature in the language. So even there, this very evil speech, there's a tender quality to it. Then we could do something complicated with context. We we, we just couldn't do this until we'd established the the for and against quite quite simply. The nope and the yep. Um, she is evil, but then isn't everyone? If you started with that, you couldn't build an argument. You'd be so finding things difficult at this stage. Uh, if you started with, yeah, well, what even is anyway, evil anyway? And then it wasn't everyone evil. Um, you couldn't proceed from there and build a, a shape of an argument. But you could certainly put it in later on, couldn't you? You could, you could add this idea in. But in the context of other people in the play, um, she's probably the most complex and intriguing character and has you know, a moral ambiguity similar to Banco, perhaps. Well, um, what about scale? We could do that. Is she as evil as the same kind of evil as Macbeth? You could do something clever there. Maybe she's this sort of 
Machiavellian manipulative evil, whereas Macbeth is a sort of blood-soaked evil in the sense of being a butcher and causing harm in that way. And, and isn't there a sense of scale there? You could do something with tragic heroes and heroines. They tend to realise their errors before they die. It's possible Lady Macbeth does this. You could argue that with some work. And that might make her less evil, I suppose, if she realises her mistake or, or has some realisation, even unconsciously, of her mistake. And then there's this all, all this other thing we've talked about that she's marked as a sinner or sort of tattooed with the blood of her crimes like Cain. So rather than that being evidence of her, um, you know, when she washes the blood from her hands, out damn sport and all that, um, that this isn't necessarily about acknowledging guilt. It might be about her being marked as a sinner. But um, that makes the question that she's evil or not, or portrayed as evil, or not, more complicated. So being marked as a sinner, sure, there's, there's, there's a sense of being marked as evil there, but isn't there an acknowledgement of the sin? Isn't there a sense of serving as a warning about evil action? So, you know, that, that Mac, Lady Macbeth is almost, a, in that sense, a character that, that's used by Shakespeare to warn about the dangers of ambition, the dangers of evil actions, and not simply an evil stock character like a femme fatale you know that you'd see in some gothic text so even I, I, I really don't want to be you know silly about this but you should think about it you know even choosing to portray Lady Macbeth in a black corset might have an impact here even staging her as you know um, this fiery you know sort of um, dark lady with um, you know sort of long you know sort of dark red or dark black hair and sort of pale skin and a, in a gothic sort of black corset you know essentially being Helena Bonham Carter choosing to do that as a director might well um, have a big impact on whether we're supposed to see her as simply evil or not right we're nearly there don't worry <laughs> okay <laughs> I don't know. I just, I just love this one. I love this idea. You can win an argument. Just hold out a bunny with a flapjack on its head or whatever it is. Um, drop it's gone or something. Right. Let's put this all together and then, and you're going to do, you're going to do an essay in a bit. So then, what we're saying is, clarify the question and the keywords in the introduction. There's still some students who aren't doing introductions. You've got to. But the introduction isn't, here's what I will write about, or here's what Shakespeare was all about. It is, what's the question actually, actually asking of me? And I'm going to clarify what the, what the key words in that class question are and what the debate is. So they define the key terms, set up what the key debates actually are, just like we did with trying to be clear on meanings before. Uh, you can't cover po every possible interpretation. You can't so cover every possible reading of a text. So you're going to focus on on a few clear differences of opinion. The, the question will invite you to do that. Simple stuff first. Please get this in, get this planned out properly. Start with evidence that's unambiguous and definite. Some students are still charging forward with really complicated uh, um, interpretations as a first step. And I want you to do complicated interpretations, but you've got to have strategy there. Leave that till later. Be fair, deal with alternative interpretations fairly, lots of evidence for other interpretations, but you can still bat them away, you can still say, well, here's why this is uh, insufficient as an interpretation, or why this interpretation falls down, um, either from a critic or one that you raise yourself, But so you can be, still be quite assertive with it, but you've got to be fair, you can't mischaracterise the other interpretation. Uh, claim small, evidence big. It's possible Shakespeare might be adding an evil quality to the character. That's fine. Lady Macbeth is all evil. Isn't fine. You wouldn't be able to do um, much with the second statement. You could be able to do a lot with the first. Uh, don't home in on the wibbly complex stuff until you've got the basics in place. That's simple. Same as doing the simple stuff first, really. Don't. I. I you know. You get the feeling in your own head. Oh, I've got a magically brilliant, you know, complicated idea. Fine, but get the basics done first in the plan. Interpretations. They've got to logically follow from the evidence that you're providing. So either your overall conclusion that must logically follow, as we've seen, but also just an interpretation. Does your evidence definitely make the interpretation work? Does it really add to what you're saying is the interpretation, or could it add to something else, or is it not quite clear? Uh, don't assert, demonstrate with evidence. So, you know, don't don't sort of assert that things are true. I just won't believe you unless you demonstrate it to me. Uh, and and this is, this is, I don't wish to be mean with this, really. I'm, I'm trying to be nice as I can, but um, it, it, it is your job. It is your job to clarify what you mean. So if there's any ambiguity there, 
it's down to you to clear it up. You, you can't expect the examiner to give you the benefit of the doubt, really. I mean, they might, but you're running a real risk. You, you've got to think carefully and clearly um, what you really mean. And, and in general, I mean, if you can't express it in words, if you can't express what you really mean in words, I'm just not going to believe that you know it. I'm not going to believe that you really do know what you mean. You might have, a, have an idea or a feeling or a, a sense within your head, but I need you to express it in words in order to, to believe that the interpretation is accurate. Uh, presuppositions, don't presuppose anything, especially about um, history, um, and don't generalize. So, 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 for example, don't presuppose that it was the past, therefore everyone was religious. That even something like that, which seems so true, it's too um, bold a claim. It can't possibly be that simple. Um, it's true, religious belief was um, more of a, a, a part of the fabric of, everybody, of everybody's life at that time. But what are you saying, that people aren't religious now, or that, that it's not significant now? I mean, it's, just, it's just too um, muddy as a claim, or too uh, much of a presupposition about the past. Um, don't presuppose that you know, um, you know, at the time everybody was poor, or at the time um, everybody went to you know uh, to the theatre. It was it was popular. It was very popular, far more popular, but in uh, in London than than other modes of um, um, of, of representation today. For example, um, there was no telly, you know, <laughs> but. Um, no novels, of course, as well. But you know, don't just presuppose that because it's it's in the past, it must therefore have been like this. Try to be subtle with it, and and of course, try to get scales right as well. Bad, worse, worst. They don't mean the same thing. So Macbeth's bad, Lady Macbeth's bad, Banquo's bad. Therefore, everyone's bad. It, no, th there's there's a scale here, and I want you to try and deal with and clarify that scale, disentangle different meanings of the same word. And make sure your argument has a shape and a destination before you put pen to paper. We always say plan, but um, I want you to move away from just planning out what goes in what paragraph to, what, to planning. What is the shape of my argument? What am I doing? What's my strategy to getting where I want to go? Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is my favourite one, actually. Um, uh, I, I just think it's brilliant. Your argument is invalid because potato. Right then, put it all together. Let's do some actual literature stuff. You've been with me a long time. I really appreciate it. I really hope it's working for you and I really hope it's going to help you to uh, construct a brilliant argument about this question that we've already seen. Lady Macbeth is a figure of compassion as much as she is a figure of contempt. So like often you get with uh, section A, what I've given you here is um, a statement and then it's to what extent do you agree? So, so note that I'm not asking for a simple for and against here. Um, but I am asking you to try and, and, and put two uh, sides there and then or perhaps um, a third more complicated answer um, or to sort of home in on this question of, well, is she um, you know, as, as much a figure of compassion as she's a figure of contempt? Look at the, the actual language there. So, yeah, it's not a question, is she good, is she bad? It's a question, you know, that uh, do we see her as good as bad? Do you agree? A lot with that statement, a little bit with that statement, uh, to an extent with that statement. Uh, do you find the statement really problematic? Do you think that it's got a lot of evidence for it? So there's your question. Is it, you know, to what extent do you agree with this, this statement? A lot, a little, a certain extent, um, not at all. Lady Macbeth is a figure of compassion as much as she is a figure of contempt. Um, hopefully you're seeing the words that need to be clarified in your introduction there. Which words do you have to clarify and offer several interpretations of, uh, clear interpretations of, before you start to argue whether it's true or not. Right then, um, I think that's it. I think I really appreciate you sticking with this. It's the first time I've done it. If it works and you enjoy it, um, it's, it's worth um, putting a little bit of effort. It probably only took me about maybe um, an hour or so to write the PowerPoint and then maybe an hour to, to record it all, get the stuff together. So it, if, if it's helpful to you, I want to put the effort in and, 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 and for you to use this. And if you like it, then uh, uh, let me know and I'll, um, I'll do another one. Okay. If you don't like it, just don't tell me. All right. <laughs> okay. Now, if you don't like it, then obviously we want some feedback. This is new for the department. Uh, we're trying to find new ways for, for getting you to, to do more work independently and to, to help you at home. So if you like it, if it works for you, uh, do let us know. But likewise, if you're not as keen, please do um, do let us know. Right then, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, uh, <laughs> um, I should mention across as well that it's, it would be try and do it in time conditions if you want. 
that's quite useful for revision. Um, so you're aiming for about three sides in an hour as a minimum, aren't you? It's normally what you want them to do. But of course, if you'd rather do this more slowly, uh, take it a step at a time, please do so. And um, if you want any more questions, you can formulate your own or you can uh, give me an email. Um, so um, my students, you should know, uh, my email, PJM, yeah, just put Phil Mark into the system and I'll come up and you can email me and I'll send you some more questions or it'd be quite nice to formulate your own. But whatever you're doing, the, the best way to do this is to um, do a full written response. So that's either in time conditions, that's very helpful, or uh, you can take your time with it and get used to what it feels like to put something together, maybe taking a little bit longer, a couple of hours to do it. But whatever you're doing, you need to uh, make sure that you are answering the question. So onwards to victory. Well done. Okay, appreciate it. Thank you. Bye-bye.